Today I'm talking with Adam Graycar, Professor of Public Policy and Director of the Research School of Social Sciences at the Australian National University. He recently gave a lecture for the Flinders Institute of Public Policy and Management on corruption in public life. Adam, could you please first define corruption? Corruption essentially is the misuse of public office for private gain. It's about trust, it's about abusing that trust, and it's about getting something that you shouldn't get from your office. Now corruption happens in the public sector, it happens in the private sector. <clears throat> in the public sector, one expects that public servants get their salary and no more. They don't get wads of cash for doing things better, quicker, or differently. If one of the main purposes of corruption is to circumvent laws and regulations, fewer laws should mean less corruption. Would that be correct? Well, the first thing to remember is that corruption follows opportunity. If you've got opportunities, then people can behave corruptly. Now, some opportunities arise from having a lot of laws, a lot of complex regulation, and there's always this balance between protecting the community, on the one hand, and uh, tying them up in red tape on the other. It's not just the number of laws, it's about how smart the laws are. It's about how sensible the laws are for the community. A great deal of corruption comes in implementing bad laws, or laws where there's a lot of discretion. Now, on the one hand, you can't possibly make a law for everything that happens. You can't cover everything in our society by a law. The best protection against corruption is not necessarily fewer laws, but more common sense and a good culture. Transparency International produces an annual global report on corruption, the Corruption Perceptions Index. Where does Australia stand on this index? Australia stands about eighth out of about 160 countries. So we're in the top 10 and we've been in the top 10 consistently for a long time. There's a bit of debate about the reliability of uh, the index, but nevertheless it's done using a lot of different measures and they're aggregated. It's no surprise that the countries at the top the richest countries, the Scandinavian countries, the Netherlands, but New Zealand's up there as well, as is Singapore. So Australia does very well on the Corruption Perception Index, and w that is quite realistic because when you look at our everyday lives, we're not being shaken down by corrupt officials all the time. We're not, <clears throat> our kids can go to school without having to pay bribes. Children can get immunized without having to pay a bribe to get an injection. There's clean water. We're not in that sort of league. But where the issues do arise is in the way in which our institutions have cultures of integrity and where institutions don't behave with integrity, it might take a long time to uncover the issues. But by and large, as far as the general public is concerned, they lead a fairly corruption-free life in Australia, in contrast to many, many other countries. In spite of being seen as relatively corruption-free in international comparison, corruption seems to be almost daily in the news in Australia. What are the major challenges facing Australia with respect to corruption? Because Australia is way up there in the top ten on the transparency scale, one of the big issues is that when we do see corruption, people are mightily offended by it. People don't want their politicians to get away with things that they shouldn't. They should be accountable. People don't want big business to do rorts and deals. People don't want people to rot the system. So when people do find a breach, very often there's a lot of egregious anger about it. We expect more from our public officials. We're probably much less tolerant than many other countries who shrug their shoulders and say, well, that's life. And this is a very similar pattern in many of the countries in the top ten. 
We don't see very much about corruption in South Australia. It is, is it a clean state in comparison with New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland, where corruption investigations appear to be almost never ending? I've not done any research personally in South Australia, but I hope to be able to do some before too long. We've looked at corruption activities in other states. New South Wales and Queensland have long and legendary histories of corruption. In Queensland, we've had premiers who have been corrupt. We've had police commissioners go to jail. We've had cabinet ministers taking shares in companies for a consideration. We've seen much the same in New South Wales. There's a current inquiry with a lot of allegations currently before the New South Wales Independent Commission Against Corruption. In my memory, I cannot remember a similar scandal in South Australia to the ones we read about elsewhere. There may well be people who have exhibited misconduct in the public workplace, but misconduct is different to corruption. Things uh, like harassment, things like bullying in the workplace. Certainly there are individuals who steal things from their employers, but that's dealt with in a criminal capacity. And uh, the culture here is not one. There is more transparency, I believe. I do believe that uh, it would be harder for people to get away with some of the corrupt activities here because it's a smaller community and there's a different culture. Finally, what can Australia learn from other countries about reducing opportunities for corrupt behaviour? This is a very difficult thing to answer because we don't know what makes corruption tick. The one thing that we do know, and this is often, there's a debate in the corruption literature. There's an old saying that says, you don't fight corruption by fighting corruption. You fight corruption by having better institutions, more integrity, better health care, and so on and so forth, in much the same way as you don't fight poverty by fighting poverty. You fight it in other ways. We've compared Australia with the top 20 countries in the uh, transparency list and the, the one pattern that comes through very, very clearly is the richer you are, the less likely. Not only richer, but richer and more equal because we do have some very ri oil rich states that are very corrupt. But when you compare us with countries like Finland, the Netherlands, Denmark, uh, there's not a lot we can learn from them. Our institutions are sound. We look to each other <clears throat> for different sorts of things that we can do. But the one interesting thing is of the top 20 countries on the transparency scale, only two have a national anti-corruption agency, and they're Singapore and Hong Kong, and there are special reasons why they have them. But none of the European countries have a national anti-corruption agency. They instead have a set of integrity pillars, and uh, those integrity pillars uh, work very well and are open to a great deal of transparency, and that's the most important thing, culture and transparency. Adam Graycar, thank you very much. My very great pleasure.